Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar express organized by CIM Yorkshire. Before we get started, I'd just like to go over a few things so you know how the event will work and how to participate in the Q&A session. The presentation will last for approximately 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a short 10 to 15 minute Q&A session. You'll be able to post any questions you have by clicking on the question mark, which you'll see on the right hand side of your screen. If watching on a laptop or along the top or bottom, if you're watching on a tablet or smartphone, you can send in your questions at any time during the presentation and we'll attempt to answer as many as we can during the Q&A at the end. If you'd like to share your thoughts about today's webinar on social media, you can use the hashtag CIM events. If you'd like to download a copy of the presentation slides, you'll find them in the handout section, along with a list of additional reading resources, which complements today's topic. We'll also be recording the webinar, which will be available to watch again in a few days' time on the CIM North Regional webpage and the CIM YouTube channel. The links for both you'll see along the bottom of your screen. So I'd now like to hand you over to Dr. Simon Kelly, who was our guest speaker today. Over to you, Simon. Thank you very much. Um, before we get into the presentation, which is really based on our book, um, which is called Standout Marketing, um, how to differentiate your organization and see a sameness, just want to tell you a little bit about the three authors. Um, first is uh, Dr. Paul Johnston, who uh, was a colleague of mine when I was working at Sheffield Hallam University. Like me, he's a pracademic. His background was uh, marketing and sales director at Bellfruit in the gaming industry. Uh, is now at Nottingham Trent. Stacey Danheiser, I met when I was running North American marketing for the third biggest telecoms company in the US, based out of Denver. Um, her background is uh, fintech, telecoms, cable, um, and some other industries. And now she's uh, the founder of Shake Marketing Group. And myself, uh, as you could tell from the gray hair, even though it's a black and white photo, um, I've had years of experience in telecoms and IT primarily. I was the marketing director for BT's uh, major business division. I've run North American marketing for the third biggest telecoms company in, in the States. Um, I now call myself a pracademic. Uh, I was at Sheffield Hallam. I'm now at the University of York. Uh, and with Shake Marketing, I, I work with the other two principals to help organizations develop uh, powerful standout marketing. OK, so let's talk about the book. We wrote a book before this, which some of you may have read, called uh, Valueology, Aligning Sales and Marketing to Shape and Deliver Profitable Customer Value Propositions. Now, this book was, if you like, um, a how to uh, develop value propositions and took you through a process from sort of understanding customers through developing uh, value propositions and executing campaigns. But through our research, we kind of discovered that there's a little bit of a problem out here uh, because organizations do seem to have problems differentiating. Uh, let's test out our, our gut feel on this. And so we did three studies. We, we've done this for three different uh, industries, but we'll bet good money on the fact if we did it elsewhere, we'd probably find the same thing. So we started with telecoms. That was our background. We analyzed the website and Twitter feeds from uh, the top 30 companies in the world. Um, and what we found was they were just all saying the same things. And we did it for data center companies. And we've also done it for UK universities. Uh, you can find white papers for the telecoms and the data center reports, which are called uh, Sea of Sameness, uh, when I give you the website details at the end of the presentation. These were our findings from the Sea of Sameness studies. First of all, the 10 most frequently used words on the website and Twitter feeds were all generic business terms like services, businesses, solutions, and then words specific to the particular industry we were looking at. So for telecoms, it was cloud, connectivity, that kind of thing. Yeah. Kind of what I'd ask you to reflect on as I'm, I'm walking through this is does this thing, uh, sameness apply in your own industry in your own context because one thing we did find which i think is very prevalent is companies talked way too much about themselves so in telecoms we're saying things like we've got a large footprint we've got a world-class infrastructure we provide 24 7 support which everybody else can provide by the way and not a lot of this is very relevant to uh, what customers 
um, are actually worried about. And then they were all making claims about being able to do fantastical things like helping companies grow and transform without any real indication that they understood the problems the customer was facing or any real specifics about how they could actually solve the customer's problem or problems. So what this leads to is, is, a, is a real lack of differentiation in, in these industries and other industries where we think this is prevalent. And the problem uh, that causes us for, for marketeers and salespeople is that it's difficult to differentiate when customers actually look us in the eye and say, well, what do you differently or better than the next person uh, in your own industry? 41% of salespeople actually cite a lack of differentiation of, as, a, as, a, as a big problem and a sales barrier. Though, interestingly enough, um, in, in our later research, which I'm going to come on to in a minute, when we ask salespeople and marketeers about, are you clear about what differentiates your organization, then salespeople had a slightly better idea than marketeers said they found it difficult to, to pinpoint what was uh, the differential for their organization. And when they were trying to articulate what helped them stand out on the websites, most people, um, most companies focus on their own company, their own products, their, their, their overall approach and their experience, and uh, not anything that was uh, uh, too customer focused um, or very customer centric. This may be familiar. So how does this all benefit the, benefit the customer was the key question we were asking. So what? You know, we've been through all these websites. We can't see any differentiation. It's not clear to us why, why if we were a customer, we would choose one over the other. And bear in mind, it especially uh, it's been heightened during, during this pandemic. Before the pandemic, lots of research from organizations like the Corporate Executive Board said that um, people in business to business situations are 60 70 percent through a buying cycle before they talk to a salesperson so all the information that they get through the marketing channel through the web and twitter feeds and, and other forms of communication uh, become more and more important so with this data from our uh, sea of sameness studies we thought well we, we really need to try and understand this problem a little bit more so we decided to do what, what we always prefer to do as, as, as the uh, pracademics in us, which is to do some in-depth interviews. So we interviewed a, a lot of sales leaders, marketing leaders, business leaders, primarily in the UK and the US, but in other countries too. Um, and we had a, a global survey and we added our findings to our, our 20 years experience, it's not just 20 for me. It's uh, a lot more than that uh, of leading organizations and, in, uh, and teaching marketing as a, as a practice in, in, in leading universities. So uh, combined with that, we, we came to our findings and, and, and our findings are really about the competencies that are required to be uh, a person who can help an organization stand out in its marketing and selling. And this is where you, you may be quite surprised and, and you may be expecting to see some skills and uh, uh, hard skills or soft skills that, that are not covered in this framework. Uh, bear in mind, we developed this framework from the output of all this research, so it's not just made up. So because we believe in customer value, because after all, that's what's at the heart of marketing, um, we wanted the... Uh, framework to add up to the word value and, and so it did uh, the five key competencies of visionary activator learner usefulness and evaluator um, and so what i'm going to do for the rest of the presentation is i'm going to just give you an overview of each of these five competencies uh, which are obviously then detailed in the book uh, uh, in uh, much more depth and uh, i'll ask you to think about as we go through um, what you would score yourself or your team just on what you've heard me say. Now in the book, there, there are obviously tools that you can use that uh, allow you to assess yourself in a little bit more depth than the, we would on this call. But it should be an interesting exercise for you to reflect on and give yourself a score as we go through. And um, before we do that, I just want to make clear that uh, we mean by skill when we talk about skill, something that you need to do your job. So if you were a footballer, you'd have to be able to tackle and dribble. 
but in order to be competent as a footballer you have to be able to combine knowledge skills and behaviors uh, to do the job in the round yeah to have resilience to have vision if you're a footballer funnily enough and that's how we differentiate between skill and competency okay the first one is visionary now i think imagine a world where your chief executive comes to you and says uh, fred or frida um, I'm really interested in you telling me what our next strategic move should be rather than um, would you be able to set up an event uh, to get as many customers as we, as we can on, online on a Zoom call to try and drive some uh, sales leads, yeah? So in order to be able to do this, then marketers need to be visionary to be able to foresee the changes in the broader environment. And if you're a salesperson, to be able to share those insights with customers. And if you're a marketeer, to be able to portray uh, that in, in the way that you're developing your strategy and the way that you talk to your customers. So this is made up of five key things. First of all is the ability to have an outside in view. That is not to get too obsessed by all the internal meetings and all the internal uh, goings on. That, that happen in those internal meetings think about what's happening in in the broader environment and like an eagle fly uh, three or four thousand foot above all the uh, environment around you and take a view as to, to to what looks as though it could be promising or threatening going forward and like an eagle to be able to zoom in to the thing that looks like it's really the next biggest opportunity or threat which means that in order to be able to do that you have to be able to take a view of predicting what's likely to happen now again we're in we're in encouraging times for for developing this particular competence because we're all going to have to lay bets on how people are going to behave and how they're going to behave differently as we come out of this pan pandemic now for example i believe uh, that lots of people are going to want to be social again um, and people are going to want to have face-to-face -face meetings and some online meetings. Other people uh, seem to take a different view. And, and so at some point, we're going to have to predict or, or guess or imagine what the world might, might be like in future. So added together, that's what a visionary does. Now, I know there are people from all different sort of backgrounds and experience levels on this call. So if you're a student at this moment in time or, or you've recently been a student then you've probably used tools like pest or pestle um, and what's disappointing is that is really what that kind of tool and that toolkit is supposed to be all about but very rarely is it used for that and very rarely do i see that organizations actually routinely use uh, tools like that um, what's missing both in education and, and, and in real organizations is the whole bit about, you know, you do their analysis at looking more broadly, because if you don't, then somebody like um, an Uber is going to come along and eat your breakfast. If, you, if you're a, a normal taxi company or the Airbnb is going to come along and eat your breakfast if you're a, um, a hotelier. So be aware of all, all the developments in, in technology. Uh, be aware of all the developments in your own industry and in the industries of your customers. Well, how can you develop these? Well, before you, you think about that, I think it'd be uh, useful if you could now uh, write down on a piece of paper in front of you or something that's nearby to you. If you were to give yourself or your team a score out of five, where one's pretty uh, poor and five is excellent uh, for this visionary competence, what score would you give yourself and why? So in terms of how to, to develop this, I think, you know, seek new perspectives. Don't just talk to people in your own organization. Ask yourself if you're, uh, you're actually going out there and asking people who may be industry experts or uh, industry analysts uh, or people that are technology experts in areas that um, uh, apply to your field or, or people that develop an interest in, in understanding how customer behaviors are changing because you know there's been a lot of changes in customer behavior over the last few years certainly if you're a business to business customer then in your normal life you know that you can just fire an app up and do things straight away uh, so why when we do things at a business to business level 
does it uh, seem to take an inordinate amount of time for companies to respond to things which would seem quite simple given our experience in B2C? The next one is is Activator, and this is pretty important. Uh, you know, it's getting buy into initiatives that, that could drive growth in the business. And for marketeers, I think it's a really important competence because you've got to be able to uh, ask for the resources and to get the commitment of the people who can drive uh, activity for you inside the organization. And or uh, if you're a salesperson, to get the customer interested enough to be activated to want to buy the thing that you're selling. So there are a few things that we think are important here. One of these terms we actually got from one of the uh, senior executives that we uh, interviewed, and that's something called balanced advocacy. Now, as marketeers, most of us start with the opening line, if we're true marketeers, of what's important to the customer. And hopefully that's what drives all your behaviours. But quite a lot of people that we interviewed said that they didn't think marketeers got a very good grasp as to what actually worked both for the customer and for the organization, balanced advocacy. And certainly people who led sales organizations, you may recognize this said, sometimes salespeople, if they're managing uh, big accounts, go native and don't um, take enough appreciation of, of, of what the thing that they're suggesting that the customer needs could do for the uh, profitability of their own organization. So that's balanced advocacy. <laughs> the second thing, and it's pretty key, is is listening. You know, a lot of the research output that we got from our uh, interview said that, you know, marketers quite often move into an environment where they've developed an idea quite often in a room full of marketers and then try to mobilize that idea without listening enough to what the other people in the organization think like the salespeople and like the other executives. So we say don't go into uh, discussions with a fully baked idea and go with the bones of a good idea and then listen to, uh, to input from uh, people who, who may have more experience or different perspective from you and then shape the idea uh, for success. And in order to do this, I think marketeers need to get better at understanding that when you take an idea back into the organization for development, you're in a negotiation situation. You know that not everything that you, you were taking forward is gonna get over the line. So you're gonna to have to appreciate um, that some things you might have to give up on, other things you might have to ramp up. And you know, while salespeople almost always all get to negotiation training we don't find that this happens very much for marketeers now above all else as a marketer you have to have tenacity because we all read the great war stories about how um dyson had uh, ideas turned down for his uh, what turned out to be fantastic hoovers i'm sure he wouldn't like me to call them that but as marketeers we're trying to get approval for things and we're not always going to get approval. And even if we do, then we're going to have competing ideas from lots of other functions like HR that are going to take up time of the people that we need to have invested in, in our idea. So you have to keep the idea front of mind and be tenacious, tenacious, tenacious to drive it through. And this takes a certain amount of people centricity. You know, some of the salespeople, uh, sales leaders said, oh, it's amazing that um, some people who, who uh, are salespeople don't seem to be as people centric as they really need to be because it's, it's a people business. And what we've tried to do with this whole competence framework is to try and say marketing is, is, is taught certainly at universities and is seen as a technical skill set where you go through certain stages and it doesn't pay enough attention to the actual skills and competences required um, by marketeers. And so finally, for the activator, there's a thing called contextualization, which we think is, is really important. So we appreciate that the difficult thing a marketeer has to do is to develop communication and develop messaging for the whole of the customer base for the organization. For example, on the website, you have to talk to all, all the customer base. But in order to be able to help a salesperson, you're going to be able to talk 
in the language of the customer that the salesperson is talking to at an individual level and an organization level. So you've got to be able to talk at those different levels of context in order to be able to activate uh, your idea and be successful. Okay, so again, score yourself out a one to five for that. I actually think that the first thing you could try to do if you if you don't think uh, uh, you know this already is actually think about how your company actually makes money. Um, quite often there is a disconnect between the chief marketing officer and the chief exec because this is not clearly enough understood. And one of the guys who we interviewed who was a commercial director for a big global organization which is a marketeer um, from, from uh, the beginning of his career he was apoplectic about the fact that you know he had a lot of marketeers that had worked for him over the years who uh, who just didn't seem to appreciate you know the the uh, business model for the company that they were working for and how the company made money and so we're coming up with with, with ideas that weren't really uh, driving their own business forward okay so the learner learn from changes in the environment in what your customers value and in what sets you apart from competitors I think by the very fact that you're on this call um, and you probably join other calls like this demonstrates a propensity to learn. So you should be ahead of the bunch of other people who, uh, who aren't doing things like this. At the heart of this is curiosity. And you can see there's a link between all these different uh, competencies. Uh, and of course, there should be. Be curious about the environment, be curious about uh, what's changing in the customer's world, be curious and naive about what your company's doing um, and question why it's doing things and why it might be taking to avert a product, product approach when you know that uh, a different path is, is a better way forward. You know, be proactive and in, engaged in, in what's happening in your, in your own business and, and in the environment around it. And above all, be reflective about what's worked, about how your own behavior uh, is actually influencing results positively or negatively. The next thing we think is, is to be fearless and, and to be able to experiment. You may have read or seen an IBM uh, report called the Modern Marketing Mandate, where it, it looked at uh, chief marketing officers and said, you know, CMOs need, need to strategically address how to help their own organizations develop value. And they classified uh, CMOs into three different levels, reinventors, practitioners, and, and aspirationals. And if you see in the detail of that report, that they, they demonstrate that the uh, reinventors are the ones whose businesses are, are, are performing much better. And what they actually call out in that is that reinventors do fearlessly experiment, try something, if it works, keep it rolling, learn from it, reflect, improve. If it doesn't work, then pull away from it, yeah? Um, and overall, be receptive to new ideas. And again, you're on this call today, so I guess that's uh, something you, you, you always try to do. Um, but people don't do that often enough. So, how good is, is you, are you and your team at, at learning on a scale of one to five, do you think? Okay, um, getting to the last two. This is probably a really important one. Um, I think we could have used different words, but we had to have a word that began with you to fit in with the uh, value th uh, theme. And, and so we called it usefulness. I mean, overall, it's really about relevance by differentiating in a way that's relevant, practical, and resonates with customers. So what you need to be able to do here is, is to connect the dots, to connect the dots from the problems that you've identified that customers have because, because you're a learner and you're trying to be a visionary, you're always trying to understand what the issues are that are affecting the customer and his environment or her environment. So, you know, the learner uh, competence really pays dividends in this usefulness uh, competency. And, and let's... Um, not hide away from this marketers can develop a bad reputation here because there's this marketing activity illusion where we're driven to do stuff because it looks good if we produce brochures and we produce campaigns but you know corporate executive board research said that 94 percent of organizations said that they tuned out from other organizations because they were 
receiving stuff which just wasn't relevant to them. Um, so this usefulness is a, is key to, to success. Um, and usefulness, therefore, is about being customer centric, but also being disciplined, disciplined in pushing back and saying to the people who come to you with with new requests, you know, that seems like a great idea, but is it actually something that the customers will appreciate and will resonate with them? And to be flexible and, and adaptable to changes um, in the customer's world and in your own world. OK, so what do you think to your own usefulness? What we're asking you to think about here is to de de deviate from the assembly line approach of always being driven to do campaigns and think about concentrating on smaller amounts of things that develop your brand um, and develop connect connectivity with a customer, if you want to call it that. So finally, we get to evaluator. This is not just about what's working or not from a, a marketing campaign or program standpoint. It's also the ability to evaluate in an objective way or as objective way as possible what could actually work or not. OK, so th it may surprise you what's in this chapter because, you know, we're not naive and neither are the people who, who we spoke to are all sales, marketing or business leaders. Um, but overall, you know, you need to be seen you know, as, as a marketeer who's doing this evaluation about your own programs to have a le level of integrity, to be to be able uh, to be trusted as a person in an organization who uh, the chief exec can go to and, and say, do, do you think this can work or not work? Uh, and therefore, once again, you have to be able to demonstrate balanced advocacy of considering what's going to work for the customer in your own organization. And to be able to connect the dots here between um, the things you were trying to achieve and the actions that got taken and, and which of them worked or not. But interesting enough, above anything else, you need uh, political now some persuasion because I'm sure we all know that it's not just about numbers. Um, you're not going to operate in an environment where anybody's going to want to see that uh, their own pet project um, taken off the agenda, even if the numbers say that they should. So, you know, there's an amount of persuasion in those situations and political nows to make to make sure that this evaluation takes place in a in a non-threatening way. So, to develop uh, your evaluation skills, just just sort of all always ask the question, well, so what, and and now what do we do? Because clearly, the evaluation needs to help you reflect on what's worked and to decide what to take forward or not. So again, think about how you score yourself one to five. So um, in the book, there's a there's a slightly bigger model, which also explains, as I'm sure you'd expect, that all this has to take place inside your own organization's culture um, and, and is driven by how the leadership behaves in an organization. Um, and we appreciate that and, and acknowledge it in the book. Uh, in, in a couple of chapters uh, that, that draws things together at the end. So how we can help going forward is, is if 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 you uh, uh, want, we can do lunch and learn sessions where we can take you on your team through uh, uh, an exercise similar to this, and we can dive deeper and look at workshops uh, which which explore how the competencies are made up in a bit more granularity and, and discuss that um, and develop that with your teams. And we're developing an, an assessment. There are lots of assessment tools in the book. Um, and so there's, there's stuff there that can help you immediately. But we're looking to get sort of a, a heavyweight assessment of this sort of Myers-Briggs uh, type, if you want to call it that, um, that people can use to assess the cells and the teams going forward. So if you're interested in that uh, or any of these uh, um, offers of help going forward, then just let me know. So I hope that's provoked some thought. I mean, here's some resources going forward. In terms of the book, uh, I don't know if, you, if you, you've you been on this podcast. It's called the Marketing book, book Podcast. It is, to my mind, the best uh, podcast about marketing books in the whole world, run by Douglas Burdett out of Virginia in the States. He's reviewed over 600 books, and he says that Standout Marketing is one of the three books that every marketeer should read. To have a successful career, the other two uh, um, are the twelve powers of uh, 
of marketing leader and another one so you can buy it uh, with a 20 percent discount at the moment from the cim book uh, bookshop or through kogan page and there are the codes uh, there are more resources on our, our website if you are interested in further discussion there are my contact details especially if you're uh, interested in um, the de assessment as we de develop it going forward and feel free to linkedin with me that's my uh, linkedin profile okay more resources on our website so i hope you've had a chance to uh, absorb some of that it's always a bit quick and uh, rushed on these kind of environments and fairly impersonal because uh, all I can see is a number at the corner of my screen, but I'd be happy to hand over for Q&A now. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Simon. Um, just by way of reminder, don't forget, you can still download a copy of Simon's presentation and the list of additional reading materials, which you'll find in the handout section. Um, okay, so we're now going to have a short Q&A session, and don't forget, you can still submit any questions you have, and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next five to ten minutes or so. And just a little reminder that if you're enjoying today's webinar and want to post on social media, you can use the hashtag CIM events. Okay, our first question is, uh, Simon, apart from uh, the sales team, who else are the key stakeholders within an organization that you should uh, attempt to negotiate with? Well, I think that's interesting. I'm, uh, clearly, the, the CFO is always somebody you've got to uh, try and convince, depending on the on the scale of the task that it that you, you, you're trying to move forward and and ultimately if you're the chief marketing officer it has to be the chief exec um, and then there are other people depending on on what it is you're mobilizing so if it's a product that needs developing then you know the product shop and engineering may have to help if you if you're in uh, that kind of organization so I think that the, the, one of the tough things about being a marketeer is your, your key job, a key part of the job is alignment and getting people aligned in your own organization. So it, it, it will differ from one organization to another, but has to and must include uh, sales, um, the, the chief finance officer, the, the chief exec in some form or other, at least. Okay. Um... Second question, once we know our score, how to how do we act on that? For example, does a certain score mean do X or could you advise? Yeah, that, that, that's interesting. And that's why we, we, we're developing the, if you like, heavyweight uh, assessment tool. Now, in the book, um, that there are uh, tools that can help you and, and advise you um, in each particular area. I mean, there's a, there's a there's a link question which we sometimes get, which is, you know, do you need to be able to do all of these to be a successful marketeer? And, and that really depends. I I think like a Myers Briggs, if you like, uh, um, you, you um, it, it can help you at an individual level. But like tools like Belbin, which are more team focused, I think if you're running a team, then I would say you need to have a balance of these uh, competencies. Uh, but not um, necessarily all of them uh, should you be fantastic at. But yeah, there are tools in the book that can help you uh, depending on your score. And, and that's why we're also developing this more, uh, if you like, heavyweight um, assessment tool as well as the tools that are in the book already. Okie dokie. Um, where does segmentation fit into your thinking? Um, I think that's 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 right at the, at the beginning. I, I think one of one of the the interesting things was um, in ma in many B two B organisations, for sure, you know, salespeople um, drive a lot of what's going off, and and therefore marketeers think they need to do campaigns the whole time. But a lot of the sales leaders said, you know, we need marketing to step up more to talk about you know what they see for the future and which new segments or which segments we should be uh, concentrating on it in order to uh, uh, develop successful go forward business yeah so yeah right in between the visionary and the activator uh, is the whole segmentation piece yeah right okay. okay do you have any examples of companies that have managed to differentiate themselves and what do you think they have done well well i i, I don't think i'd come out with anything um, that that's too uh, too far away from what people would expect i mean on, on a business uh, to business level though i think i probably use somebody like salesforce.com who who first of all 
realise we're in an environment that uh, uh, the existing uh, offers were way too complicated and, and started to develop something which was uh, um, much more user friendly uh, and also uh, um, developed a brand based on a real purpose rather than just, um, um, if you like, using tech speak the whole time. Um, other than that, I mean, I would always encourage people if they don't look at it routinely to look at, you know, Interbrand's list of 100, the 100 most valuable global brands um, and dig into some of those because it's usually because uh, uh, they've differentiated themselves well and took the brand more seriously than, uh, than, than, than others do in the same field. Right. Okay. Um, this next question um, sounds like it comes from the heart, actually. How do you break out of the numbing but regular experience of a discretionary marketing budget being one of the first areas to cut when belt tightening happens? Oh, wow, and uh, that's a great question, and it's it's the one about world peace. Uh, yeah, the, the, um, the book I, I'm just reading because I'm going to do a podcast with these guys now is, is one called Humanizing B2B, and, and I think this is back to this question about negotiation. Um, quite often, the, it's the chief exec who, who, who has a poor understanding of what brand is, yeah, and therefore what, what marketing is. And so I think there's, there's a job that needs to be done at, at a senior level of, of really um, making the, uh, uh, the senior execs understand what the value is in marketing beyond just, just campaigns. But then at the more routine level articulated in this uh, uh, competence set is I do think we have to get better at being able to evaluate what's worked and, and what's not worked to demonstrate that uh, if the marketing um, budget does get cut, there's going to be uh, an adverse effect on performance. And if it does get raised, then it will have a positive effect. Yeah. Um, right. Oh, and I'm not just making that up. I, I mean, I, it, it is part of my role at BT. I did actually get the marketing budget uh, increased by fivefold when I was the uh, uh, head of marketing for, for that particular division. So I'm not just making that up, folks. OK, <laughs> but I, I acknowledge that it's tough. I also think that there's a, there's a question that individuals need to ask themselves, uh, perhaps when the economic conditions are improved, I understand is that sometimes if, if you're a marketeer and, and you're in an organization where the culture's not right, then you're never going to put that right, that attitude of, oh, we're always going to um, reduce marketing spend in tough times. And if you're in that environment, you need to think about if that's right for you uh, over time, yeah? Okay. Okay. Um, what strategies would you use in a market that is dominated by a particular brand? Um, I, I, that that's interesting and 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 as like a, an answer to any question in marketing is always always it depends now um so on what the reason is for its domination um and uh, um what its weaknesses are and, and whether you whether it is that dominant brand that you need to challenge in order to get uh market share you know we, we've we've talked about um, Uber as an, an example, and we've talked about Airbnb, who, who, who's a brand new to the world invention, who, who, who took away a share from um, lots of the biggest hotels. Um, and so, you know, that that's an extreme example. But even in a, in, a, in a market that's dominated by one brand, there have got to be segments and got to be opportunities um, to actually develop new offers and to talk to customers in new ways that can can drive you growth, yeah? Okay. Um, this refers back to something you presented earlier, um, which is, can you explain con contextualization further, please, and being able to talk the customer and sales language? You referred to use of websites for this. Yeah, yeah. The, um, th this is in bo both of our books, actually. We have a tool called, called the Value Stack, and so I'll just talk briefly through that. So what we're saying is that, if, if you're a marketing uh, director or the chief marketing officer, then you have to be able to talk to the whole of the customer base through your broader communications. So what I did when I was at VT um, in a major business role is I stopped talking about 5,000 products and I started to, we started to talk about two big themes, one of those being agility. In other words, we can help you be more agile and that's what 
we actually communicated to all customers across the whole of the business landscape. But then as you move towards um, the actual customer, a person in an organization, first of all, if you split um, your customers by industry sector, then you need to sort of tailor what agility means for that industry sector, yeah? And then when you, when you move from industry sector, say banking towards an individual organization like HSBC, you have to be able to express that in their context. Um, and then when you're talking to HSBC, if you look at the research, there's any number between six and 10 people will be required to make a decision about what's being purchased. So you need to be able to speak in the context of each of those different people, um, both from a role perspective, chief finance officer, chief marketing officer, uh, chief technology officer or whatever, and to those people as, as human beings. So that's the different levels of context. And of course, you know, as a marketeer, you've got to be able to talk in the language of the salespeople uh, um, throughout that to be able to get them to uh, to work with you to mobilize some of the campaigns and, and, and programs you're developing. Okay. So this one is uh, really a comment for discussion, really. Is the reason so many businesses sound or look so similar because they have to occupy easily identifiable territory to reassure customers? If you look too different, you risk being unconvincing or dangerous. I, th I think I think that's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, th what what we're saying is that 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 we would agree with that to a, to a degree, but we think that a lot of the people are using the same language, but it's the same language that's actually not appealing or resonant with resonant with customers. Um, but you know, we do explain in the book why this tendency towards sameness happens and, and whoever asked that question um, you know has, has nailed that we, we are, well, as human beings we have this herd instinct um, and just as a piece of gold dust um, I don't know if anybody else saw this in LinkedIn um, I saw that um, somebody posted a rejection letter to Brian Ferry who was lead singer of Roxy Music I don't know if anybody uh, uh, knows that band um, Polydor the record company rejected Roxy Music uh, saying that um, he thought the music was great and, and, and different from everything else that was out there, but it was too risky for them to take them on board. Um, and, you know, the rest is history. Roxy Music got another na label and uh, and were a massively successful band. So, um, you know, we're, we're saying out there that there is money to be made by, by being different. And uh, I'm sure we can we can all think about companies that, that, that have um, driven um, performance by being sufficiently different and, and proud about the brand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, probably time for a couple more questions. Uh, a lot of the same tactics are applied to B2B marketing, for example, newsletters, white papers, blogs. In order to differentiate, should we move away from the same tactics that are applied by our customers, our competitors, sorry? Yeah, I, th I think um, I think that's that's interesting. Again, I just sort of refer back to this uh, the most recent uh, book I've been reading myself about uh, um, you know humanizing business to business, and a lot a lot of the research that's been done for LinkedIn, uh, the LinkedIn B two B marketing practice by uh, Lesbian A and Field, so there was has talked about the fact that there's too much activation in business to business meaning the word in a different way that we're, we're talking about in our, our competence set, but too many, too many programs, too many um, different um, campaigns, and that we should um, do more like business to consumer and, and do more, if you like, brand and value building. So yeah, think about moving more of the spend away from activity that's sort of straight line, oh, let's do this to try and, and develop more leads, to think about how can we help our brand stand out and, and look, look different, yeah, and therefore try yeah. some stuff as well. Okay, great. Um, final question then. Um, I work with SMEs and find there is often a huge disconnect between business owner, managers, and an often junior marketing person focused on Marcoms. Could your approach have a role in healing this rift and helping SMEs see marketing as more than comms? Oh wow! Yeah, some brilliant questions here. That's that's great. I mean, 
we call this phenomenon, and, I, and I, I'm not playing this myself. I worked with somebody called Sheila Hanna worked when I worked in BT. She was a senior marketer, and she used to call this thing kids against tanks. Yeah, um, it happens in in big business where junior marketers have to uh, rub up against uh, account directors who are, who are really experienced and pay, paid lots of money to look after the biggest accounts. And it happens in SMEs because at the outset. Um, the SME um, owner uh, leader thinks that the marketing job is about communications and so we often find and we, we help quite a lot organizations think about okay well what who is it you should be hiring next um, and there has to be a transition from the junior marketeer who's just about comms to, towards um, hiring people who, who can help drive and develop the strategy yeah because um, yeah. otherwise, where are you going to get this uh, this visionary uh, competence set from to to uh, um, think about where you're going to take your organisation going forward? So that's a great question, and, and it's tough. Um, but I think it, it becomes a time for every uh, startup business moving to towards being an SME, where they have to make the switch from junior marcoms people to um, more strategic marketeers. Yeah. Yes, that was indeed a great question. And we've had some other great questions and, and answers there too, Simon. So thank you very much for that. Um, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for for our webinar today. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Simon for today's presentation and CIM Yorkshire for organising the event. We do hope you found it interesting and worthwhile. Our next webinar express, The Science of Storytelling, is next week on Tuesday, the 13th of April at one o'clock. This one's hosted by CIM East of England. You'll find it listed on the events page on the CIM website where you'll be able to find out more information and register for the session. And finally, you'll be emailed a short survey on today's webinar. We'd love to hear your feedback. It'll only take a few minutes and all survey responses are anonymous, so please do let us know your thoughts. On behalf of CIM, thank you once again, Simon, for your presentation and thank you thank for you. joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Goodbye.